A couple of days ago, I was running my eyes through an article, and in this article, it was mentioned that the famous American author, Isaac Asimov, was asked to sort of put down on paper what he thought the world would look like in the year 2019, and perhaps it was kind of like an ode to uh, Orson Welles. And um, keep in mind, this was, this was 40 years ago. And one of the concepts that, uh, according to this paper, uh, that was put forward was that of computerization. I think the more technical term that he used was uh, the march of the computers. And um, in his words, through industrialization, sort of the transformation of power going from farm to factory uh, was one that was swift, it was one that was painful. And according to him, the transformation of power that was to be experienced from factory to this new age of computerization or the march of the computers would be even more swift and even more uh, uh, painful. So without a doubt, we've seen some profound advances when it comes to concepts like uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, robotics, um, space and bioengineering, just to name a few. From my understanding is that technology at a sort of very macro level, at a very international level, is one of the key drivers when it comes to uh, the transformation of power. And it is essentially countries on the world stage that uh, take advantage of some of these groundbreaking technologies uh, that will be, um, that will reap the benefits of acquiring uh, a strategic competitive advantage. That's my short intro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the TRT World Forum's uh, third public session. It is titled The Global Race for Technological Superiority, Shifting Paradigms in the Age of Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity. I will be your moderator. I am Adi Janayanash. Uh, I would like to waste no time and actually introduce our esteemed panelists. To my left is Maurizio Chieri. Maurizio spent many years with NATO. Uh, he is a researcher analyst and advisor in the field of international security and diplomacy. Maurizio, good to have you on stage. To his left, we have Bahar Esmat. He is the managing director for the Middle East and Africa for ICANN. For those of you who may not be familiar with ICANN, it is a nonprofit partnership that is, uh, uh, that wants to keep the internet stable, secure, and interoperable. And as far as I understand, your company is not responsible for the content that is put on the internet. Mm -hmm. Let's make that disclaimer. Okay, and finally rounding off this uh, wonderful trio of gentlemen is Glenn Gilmore. Glenn is a digital media expert and strategist. Glenn, good to have you. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, Time Magazine called Glenn a man of action. Uh, and he's also on the Forbes top 20 when it comes to this field as well. We're gonna put you uh, on the spot with regards to this. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. I would like to set the stage. Uh, maybe let's begin with you, Glenn. In terms of artificial intelligence, take us from recent years where, where Isaac Asimov left off his, his essay. Uh, how artificial intelligence has, has changed our lives? We see the use of uh, artificial intelligence in many positive ways. For example, uh, we now know that, that artificial intelligence can diagnose a medical condition better than a room full of doctors, the best doctors. And we're seeing uh, applications in which artificial intelligence is adding efficiencies by taking an enormous amount of data and digest it, digesting that data very quickly and providing us with solutions so that uh, in cities, in factories, in buildings, we have greater efficiencies in sustainability because we know where energy is being lost. We know before systems are going down, so we have what phrase called predictive maintenance, predictive analytics. Before a problem happens, it could be noted and addressed. So we're seeing a lot of uh, uses for artificial intelligence that takes out of the hands of people decision-making and automates in, in a way that we hope is 
beneficial to all of us. But in the process, if you talk to people who are really expert in artificial intelligence, they'll often say that even they don't fully understand how it works. And that's where we need to be very concerned because we're creating this in AI we trust and yet we're not quite <laughs> sure how it fully works, but we are sure that there are, there are instances in which it embeds bias, in which it may not be as reliable as we think it is. So as we look to the now and into the future, we have to add more transparency. The phrase is responsible AI. We have to know that, that the data it's looking at is inclusive so that the decisions it makes are not biased, are not exclusive. Bahar, let me, let, let me ask you kind of the same question, but in terms of how does AI fit in the context of the internet? So um, the, the internet, as many of you know, is a, a network of uh, networks. And it, uh, it, it was uh, designed and built uh, based on um, uh, uh, technical uh, standards. We call them protocols. And uh, these protocols, uh, they uh, help uh, devices, they help computers, they help networks uh, speak to, uh, to each other. Um, and what, what I can, the organization I work for, is uh, responsible for uh, is basically the coordination of the naming system of the internet. This is the system, you know, when you go online and you, uh, you know, type something like trt.com.tr, this yeah. is an address that is part of a global naming system called the domain name system. And this is the system that I can, together with many uh, of our technical uh, partners, uh, are responsible for coordinating at the global, uh, global, uh, global level. And, and this system, actually, what, what makes the internet the one single global network that we have today, because it's, it's like you know, the, the one thing that keeps the internet together. Now, whether it's AI, whether it's social media, whether it's you know, uh, a, uh, an online e-commerce service or anything, all this comes on top of the internet. So the internet is, you can look at it, there is the infrastructure part, okay? And part of this infrastructure is the naming and addressing system, and then anything could, you know, go on top of this infrastructure in terms of services and applications, including new technologies like AI and others. Glenn said we don't know where this is going. Um, do you ever feel that artificial intelligence can actually be that base layer and, and sort of bypass the internet? Is, is that even an intelligent question? Well, it, 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 could, it could become part of uh, anything that we as end users do online. But to what extent, to what uh, level, I think, you know, it's not clear yet. But yeah, it could okay. become part of anything that we do. Mauricio, let me, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, Glenn was sort of, when he was describing artificial intelligence, he said that um, it's essentially sort of taking people out of the decision-making making mechanism. Uh, it sounds very revolutionary. The reason why I bring this up um, is you come from a part of the world where another revolutionary uh, age began, and I'm talking about the Renaissance. You're from Florence? Yes, yes, um, that's correct. That being said, I want you to sort of bring your interpretation. Yes. First of all, Igi Akshamlar, if I can say good evening. Uh, let me, thank you. Let me commend, the, first of all, TRT. It's the first time that I've been invited and uh, your government, because it shows uh, the ability to create uh, different points of view uh, together in a forward-looking uh, way. Because r r right now, nowadays, we are at the edge of a revolutionary era. Even more than what Asimov said, you can read Yuval Harari. There are many young people here. There is a lot of youth. I believe in youth. You will live this transformation, this speciation, as uh, this Israeli historian call it, Yuval Harari. Homo Deus, he wrote the book, uh, The Man God. So we are very frightened about this because there is a, a dystopia over there that could transform our humanity. At the same time, we are very also excited because these are the best times you could live in history. I can say that many things improved. Technology helped a lot societies to improve. Now you call about uncertainties and opportunities. 
What I'm saying is this. During the Renaissance in Florence, I come from Florence, where Leonardo came from, after the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, what we thought was to invest in polymath, meaning in people that were able to put together science, engineering, like my colleague is in engineering, but also people that were able to understand societies, politicians. So Leonardo was able to draw, for example, the first bicycle, the first tank, speaking about the military, the first uh, UFE, because he drew also helicopters, but at the same time, he was drawing Mona Lisa, he was having creativity, he was having critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So what we need today is to put together the STEM people, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but also with the critical thinking, political scientists, sociologists, because we have to give a meaning to this revolution. Otherwise, it's going out of our hands. Why? Because it's exponential. So, technological revolution is exponential, means that respect to the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution 10,000 years ago or 200 years ago, those revolutions were gradual. They transform society gradually. This revolution, it can transform society very quick. With the social media, we saw how we are attacked as democracies. We saw our mindset changing because we are not able to focus more than three minutes, three seconds you know, with the, with the disturbance yeah. of the social media. So what I'm saying is that we are on the edge of a revolution that could, before, uh, you know, someone put the chip in your head, like Elon Musk said, I will be the first to put and become a superhuman. Before to do that, we have to understand who we are, what we want in our future, also at security level, because it can destroy our society. It's already destroying, because we are already fragmented, feeling loneliness, feeling solitude, Polarization, our democracies are not only polarized, but they are also, there is a populism coming with the misinformation, with the uh, propaganda. I, I saw a very good document, uh, it's called a documentary called The Century of the Self, from a British documentarist. Century of the of Self. The self. Okay. It speaks about how our subconscious mind guide our actions. Because, you know, from psychologists, the most recent science, 100 years ago, you know, the uh, psychoanalyst uh, Freud, he explained how the subconscious guide our actions. And the social media and the technology appeal to that subconscious because it makes you angry, for example, if some troll put you a sentence on your website. But you don't, should not care because you don't know even who is this person or if, if it's a person. So going back again to Renaissance, one is to uh, navigate through these seas of uncertainties through polymaths, but also recreating social capital. Social capital means in those times, and nowadays too, what we need is to recreate civil society through cooperation, associations, because those civil societies in those Renaissance times, they were the civil society that brought democracy. They brought a new uh, push for, for science. And this means that we have to recuperate it instead of destroying it like, like Okay, I mean, so, so we, need, we need polymath, we need stems, we need people to be critical thinkers, we need uh, to increase social capital, I get that. Um, but when you look at sort of the world that we live in today, uh, I'm gonna call it superpowers, they exert their, their power through, through warfare, yeah. through defense industries. Um, how, does, how does AI, yeah. And I'm asking you this question because you have spent many years at NATO and, yeah. and, and you're able to put this into perspective for us. Yes. So I wanted to start with the domestic social issue because that's the basic, the base. But then going up in the global power competition, going up among uh, this fight for who is getting before the uh, knowledge of AI, we know that uh, America called this decade the decisive decade, means who is winning this uh, competition in artificial intelligence will win the rest of the century. So, you know, Xi Jinping just said that he wants to be the leader of artificial intelligence by 2030. Putin, the murderer, he said, who is going to lead in AI will rule the world. So we need to be fast. Because as I said at the beginning, it's an exponential technology that is going on. So we need to be fast means our bureaucracies, our military infrastructures, our um, um, capabilities need to be adapted quickly to the technological revolutions. And that's why we need more investment also in our, from our governments, from NATO, European Union, from UN, in this AI in order for us in the West, in the democracies, to become the first 
to have that, because there is also a problem of ethical, because who is going to win this war is going to decide also the future ethics, because if some dictatorships get the artificial intelligence power before us, it happens like the nuclear power. The nuclear power, thanks God, instead of Nazi fascism, was before in the United States of America. And thanks to that, then we had the possibility to recreate the liberal order, the United Nations, and all the non-proliferation treaty. But if China or Russia get the advantage, the comparative advantage in artificial intelligence technology, talking about military, yeah. that's the risk of humankind, because these people are crazy. They are rational thinkers, but at the same time, they want to recreate another world, another order. They said that. They, write, they wrote an agreement before the invasion of Ukraine, Xi Jinping and Putin. And they said, we are going to fight you, we want to create a new order, and if we come before with our technology, we will use it to, against you. Glenn, let me ask you, I mean, just sort of uh, to, to roll off what Maurizio was saying, I mean, if Russia, if China are major threats, do you think that sort of governments around the world are, are, are fully aware, are they fully cognizant of some of the challenges uh, that is put forth in terms of um, shifting into an era of artificial intelligence? I, I, I think everyone is painfully aware of the phrase, a artificial intelligence arms race. And that should be worrisome to all of us because we're talking about a technology that, that should be technology for good, but it's become a artificial intelligence arms race. And uh, there's no question that, that the military application of artificial intelligence has become a necessity because in the world of uh, hypersonic weaponry, you need to have technologies that can make very, very split-second decisions. But we have to be fearful in a way because of the, the, there's a, a story that, that everyone who thinks about uh, artificial intelligence, especially in the application of, of, of warfare, should be mindful of. Uh, a gentleman, uh, Stanislav Petrov, Petrov, who 30 years ago was tasked in Russia with monitoring their early warning system, their nuclear defense system. And his job was to monitor, and if he saw uh, evidence that, that there was an attack coming, particularly from the U.S., that it should be put up to the next level, which would then trigger a nuclear response. And as he watched his digital screen, he saw a nuclear missile launch from the United States against Russia. And then he saw a second one. And the alarm went off that, that, that again, this digital warning system that he had. Then a third missile came. And he decided, based on his intuition, not to put up to higher headquarters that information because he knew if he did, it would trigger automated responses. Automated responses meaning a nuclear attack against the United Mutually States. Mutually assured destruction. So, so this individual who not many people know about prevented, likely, a nuclear war. What would have happened if we entrusted that early alert system solely to artificial intelligence? we may not be here having this panel. Do you think there are people out there or countries out there with the same sort of good conscience as AI develops like it did after Los Alamos? I, I have to, to say that, that one of the things that, that I find encouraging, for example, in the war in Ukraine, uh, the US Secretary of Defense recently called the Russian Secretary of Defense and said, let's just talk about what's happening on this battlefield today so that we don't misjudge, we have an understanding of what our relative positions are so that we don't just make the mistake of, of pushing it to a nuclear war or, or something even worse. It's terrible as it is, but we need to have always uh, that human uh, decision making. AI can supplement and it has to supplement, uh, but human decision making ultimately should be the final word. Right, let me. Let me. I want to. I want to get you in. A, do, do you feel that uh, that sort of international governments or intergovernmental organizations are 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 really up to the challenge in terms of uh, riding this wave of change? Are they prepared to to, to stand up to the challenges? So um, again, from from um, a technical perspective, it's. Uh, I mean, we we. Organizations like ICANN and, and, and other organizations in the field of internet uh, governance, uh, they, uh, uh, years ago, they uh, 
uh, adopted uh, a model that is called uh, multi-stakeholder model, uh, whereby uh, stakeholders from across the spectrum, from governments, intergovernmental organizations, uh, NGOs, academia, and business, and so on, they come together and they engage in serious work, be it technical work, be it policy development work, and so on, uh, in regards to, uh, to the internet and the, you know, the evolution of technologies, the development of policies, and, and so on. And uh, uh, IGOs or intergovernmental organizations, they, they do take part in, in, in these, uh, uh, in these uh, you know, uh, interactions. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the uh, 17th uh, uh, Internet Governance Forum, this is a UN forum that uh, discusses uh, internet governance uh, just took place in Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. And uh, AI was, you know, uh, very present on the agenda as one of the key topics along with cybersecurity and, and several other topics. So to your questions, uh, to your question, uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, governments are involved, IGOs are uh, involved, but again, I mean, the, the issues are uh, very, um, sort of uh, uh, dynamic, and it depends whether you're talking in a uh, technical forum or a political forum, how things would, uh, would, would look like. From your position, tell me what you want to see in terms of sort of greater inclusivity when it comes to all this. So we want to see, uh, you know, one of the amazing things about the internet is that it uh, creates opportunities for everyone. Today we have over five billion uh, users connected to this, you know, global, uh, global network. However, do they have equal opportunity? Uh, can we do better in terms of what we can offer them, in terms of what we call uh, meaningful connectivity? So to, to get access to the internet is one thing, but to get meaningful access to the internet is another thing. Uh, we, uh, talking, talking of inclusivity, we're very, uh, you know, uh, focused on uh, you know, getting the next billion uh, users uh, come online and use the internet using their own languages, using their own, you know, keyboards and, and scripts. If I come from, you know, uh, an Arabic-speaking country, then I'd, I'd rather see more content in my language online. I'd rather use addresses and domains in Arabic and, and so forth, you know, Chinese and so on. So. Uh, we have one of the uh, projects, you know, that we've been uh, working on uh, called internationalized domain names. And, and this allows countries, businesses, communities to have their domains in their native languages and uh, scripts. Today we have over uh, uh, 40 countries with 60 plus uh, uh, top level domains representing those countries online, representing their cultures. Uh, we need to see more of this. We need to see more uh, uh, of this coming from uh, Africa, from Asia, from mm -hmm. Latin America, and so on. So, Maurizio, let me turn to you. I mean, uh, Bahar was talking about his approach to sort of um, uh, more inclusivity. I mean, we need more meaningful access to the internet. When it comes to uh, the global population, talk to us about some of the dangers that we're, we're faced with uh, the fifth generation warfare, especially when it comes to what we're talking about, AI. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, say this. When, uh, first of all, many people maybe don't, don't know first generation, but the first generation yeah. was hand by hand for thousands of years. Then you had the second generation with the gunpowder, so the killing increased. You had the third generation with the aerial power, and then we had the world wars, with that was a disaster. Aerial power, missiles, etc. came also the nuclear power. The fourth generation is the recent one, when you have non-state actors, you have guerrilla, you have terrorism, and we are still in these four generations. The fifth one will be the automized one. Now, how impact uh, artificial intelligence, and in general, the technological revolution, not only artificial intelligence, we spoke about uh, hyper, uh, hypersonic missiles, we speak about quantum computing, we speak about big data processing. It's impacting in three ways, the, the, the military warfare, and so the competition in the future. One is the automation of the capabilities. So you are expert here, you have UA, UVAEs, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, risk there because, uh, you know, the killer robots, there are some NGOs in, in the US like Human Rights Watch, etc. they try to ban these killer robots. But as I said, it's better if we get before that technology, then 
the other ones, because the other ones are dictatorship, they go against us, and we don't know if they will be ethical and respect the rule of law as we want to do, because you know, our uh, international organizations, they have already AI agreements, UN, European Union, NATO, to respect the law of, law, the law of war, meaning uh, you know, proportionality, necessity, etc. But the dictatorship, they, they cannot guarantee you that. So that's one point. The second impact that uh, they have, uh, the, the technological revolution on military warfare, the fifth generation, is the data processing. So in that world, we are living already the big brother with the fa face recognition. You know, in Italy, they just discovered 10 police stations of China. They are checking, you know, Chinese citizens in Italy with the facial recognition, etc., to see what they are doing, what they are not doing. Uh, also, Ukraine, thanks God, is using that facial recognition also because uh, the, the intelligence is also able to process data, for example, uh, much faster than human beings. You know, the intelligence in the past, you had to listen to a phone call. Now they can, uh, how do you call that in English, select and sift among the communication and select what is the most important. So the process of data also is an advantage but it can be done also uh, in, a, in a bad way. Like, for example, uh, you know, Russia is using now cryptocurrency is a processing data also process in order to monetize the resources that they are blocked because of our sanctions. Mm -hmm. So this is the second impact, you know, the, the big data analysis of made by AI. Uh, with the propaganda machine, with the uh, fake uh, news, etc., trolls. And then the third one is the command and control, because military cannot work without command and control. And command and control now is starting to give more and more to artificial intelligence the power to decide which are the targets, when to strike. So it's becoming from automized weapons to automized battlefield. But that is very risky because you are giving back maybe your free will. As he said about this person that blocked the nuclear uh, attack, if you give everything in the hands of the artificial intelligence, you don't have any more the decision making of human beings. How, how is that distinction going to be made? Yeah, that distinction has to be made with, uh, as I said earlier, uh, regulations and also technologically. What about the global south? I mean, how, how are they going to sort of uh, face the dangers of of what you talk, just talked about? Well, the Global South is all another topic because, you know, okay. the problem is that there is not the same type of uh, development technological that you can have, for example, in the West. Let's speak about Africa. They have a giant youth bulge. So the important thing will be to invest in STEM, to invest in science, technology, yeah. and in mathematics, but also to invest in education in general to fight this, uh, you know, uh, fake news because we are actually currently in the post-data and the post-fact and post-truth informational society. And in order to go back to truth, data, and uh, science, you need to do education, to give critical thinking to the people, to give ability to the people to understand what is science. So investment in education, investment in STEM, and obviously uh, integrate in regional organizations, for example, African Union, because regional organizations can help other countries that are a lower level of technological development to grow together. That's why we believe in European Union and we believe also in NATO. NATO, thanks to the uh, technological edge of US, but also Turkey, etc., we can share with all the countries of NATO, the alliance, and some country that is in the, maybe in the backwards in the evolution can go up. So I think international organizations can help a lot in ethical values, rule of law, regulamentation of this development, but also in helping the countries that are a little bit in the back technologically to go up. But we, we're talking about AI, and, and, I, and I appreciate your comments, but let me ask you something which has been, so the concept has been thrown around. I don't know much about it, and I'm not afraid to admit it. Talk to me about how Web 3.0 um, is going to change our lives, change the internet. Is it going to democratize it more? Is it going to make it more free? Well, the, the short answer is we don't know. And, uh, um, you know, um, I, think, I think the, the, the general concept uh, behind uh, what is called uh, Web 3.0 is to, um, you know, to try to make the, uh, the internet uh, less centralized or maybe more uh, decentralized to try to uh, allow uh, us as end users uh, you know uh, the opportunity to um, to uh, to have more control over our own data information and so on but but the thing is 
at least to my knowledge, you know, I, I don't think there is a uh, 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 like uh, uh, a definition, a clear definition of what Web 3.0 uh, uh, is, or at least there isn't like a widely shared understanding of what uh, 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 it is. But the general concept again is that you know, with technologies like AI uh, uh, or blockchain or others, that uh, the web of the future uh, will be different than the web of today or web uh, 2.0. Uh, now, uh, again, like, like, like with any uh, technology evolution, uh, there are uh, you know, pros and cons, right? I mean, there are good things that technologies bring, and probably there are some you know, maybe disadvantages or risks. And for ICANN, again, because our, our uh, mission is to, to ensure the security stability of the internet, so one of the risks that we see with the current models that are being discussed under the, you know, big, uh, you know, sort of uh, heading of Web uh, 3.0 is that some of those uh, systems today, uh, they uh, provide uh, alternate uh, identifiers or alternate names and, and some of them, some of the you know, organizations working in this field today, they sell those names as you know, domain names. They call them blockchain domains, mm -hmm. where in fact they're not domains. They're not part of the domain name system of today. They are like you know, a separate system. And the risk there is that you know, if you have multiple systems with multiple you know, uh, uh, addresses or names and so on, those systems will not be able to speak to each other. So we will end up having you know, more than one system, more than one network, you know, fragmented internet. This is kind so of like uh, the metaverse thing, that there are multiple metaverses and we don't know if they're kind of linked or there isn't one. And yeah, from, from our perspective, you know, so long as those systems work on the one standard and interoperable internet, then we're fine from mm -hmm. our perspective, because these are all systems that work on the same internet. But once you're talking about different naming systems and different identifier systems, then the risk of having multiple networks and multiple internets is there. Glenn, um, if Bahar was saying that it, it, it's, we really don't know what Web 3.0 is going to look like, if we're having difficulty in sort of identifying it, that does also bring in sort of the idea of, so then how do you sort of identify some of the challenges and some of the opportunities then as well? It's a challenge that we all have to wrestle with. When we talk about Web 3.0 and we talk about the, the metaverse, very often we're talking about a technology, the use of virtual reality that, that immerses us in different worlds. And, and what, what's so powerful about the metaverse or so powerful about a technology like virtual reality is you feel immersed in a place. You can have side conversations with people. I've attended conferences in the metaverse, and when you do, you're sitting next to someone who you can actually have a conversation with. That avatar isn't an AI-generated avatar, it could be, but, but very often it's another person. And so we're seeing a world in which, through the use of technology, we can go to a refugee camp and provide them with training on how to become a doctor. And the training isn't just watching a flat screen, but it's actually picking up equipment and using uh, what appears to be a, a body. And, and this is being done at, at the greatest universities, and it should be accessible globally so that we can make that technology technology f for good. Uh, the challenges in this Web3 and, and in the metaverse is that question of how do we close the digital divide to make sure that it isn't just the wealthiest countries that get to tap into this technology, but that it's made accessible to, to everyone. And I know that that can happen in the US. They had a, a collaboration between the New York Times and uh, Google in which they sent out a million virtual reality boxes that allowed people who had a smartphone to experience the metaverse, to experience virtual reality. And we need to prioritize that uh, so that uh, Mauricio and others have, have noted the fact that we, we need to, to invest more in making STEM accessible so that the women in the audience could be women on the stage talking to us about yeah. what the future of AI and the metaverse and Web 3.0 should be. 
since you mentioned uh, the New York Times, since you mentioned the Go uh, since since you mentioned Google, let me ask you. I mean, um, when you think about sort of the metaverse and 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 uh, and what we're talking about, one of the common concepts that regularly keeps on coming up is that of decentralized, uh, decentralized cryptocurrency, dis whatever. Um, do you think that decentralized media is possible in 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 the realm of all this? Media has become big business. It has. And, and media has incredible resources to bring to bear. I do hope, however, though, that, that as we look to the future in Web 3.0, that we can have more citizen journalists. And I emphasize journalists because there's a difference between taking a video and, and uploading it to TikTok or, or Instagram and actually being a journalist, which brings in standards of professionalism. Uh, I do think, though, that, that as we look to Web 3.0 and we see that, that digital twins are being created of cities and places, we'll have an ability to visit those, those cities and places when we talk about news, actually visit where the news is happening. Let me put you on the spot. Do you think it's a good thing of Elon Musk acquiring Twitter in terms of, of media and journalism? No. Okay. <laughs> in a word. No. In a word. Mm. Okay, um, Maurizio, let me come back to you. Um, it's sort of something of your area of expertise because we need to sort of wind down. I mean, in terms of an organization that you worked for for many years, we're talking about NATO, uh, talk to us about how they are prepared, their readiness level in terms of AI threats, cybersecurity threats. Uh, I know that you kept on giving examples of Russia and China. Where, where do we stand right now? Well, uh, NATO is already much advanced uh, thanks to the countries, including this one that is investing in artificial intelligence. We have a strategy for artificial intelligence. We have a committee for artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a center of excellence. Now, the point here is to understand how uh, the competition should uh, reinforce our STEM youth, as he said about uh, also women. Uh, we have to balance in the society with the investment on the youth. Because the youth now, uh, for example, NATO is opening Diana, Defense Innovation Accelerator of North Atlantic. This means that we need to accelerate, as I said earlier, it's very fast, the technological revolution. And how we do that? Investing in new startups. Now they have, a, for example, a famous um, you know, venture capital. It's the first time that the public system, you know, invest with the risky, you know, so with some startups that you don't know if effectively the technology will uh, succeed or not. But at least you give a possibility to the creativity of the youth to invent a new, uh, you know, te technology, to a new te technique or a new system uh, with uh, some risk at, uh, you know, economic level. So this is a good, uh, a good investment. So we're talking about youth. Uh, investment is needed in there. We talked about Global South. Bahad, let me ask you, how do you get sort of um, multilateral organizations uh, and governments in, in terms of supporting them? So um, just, you know, uh, in, in, the past, uh, in the past year, we've been uh, working very closely with um, uh, African uh, stakeholders uh, from the um, uh, African Telecommunication Union, uh, from the International Telecommunication uh, uh, Union, ITU, uh, the regional office in, uh, in Africa, from uh, a number of the you know, internet organizations across, uh, across Africa. And the, we initiated a, what we call Coalition for Digital Africa. We just uh, you know, launched it officially uh, last week in Addis Ababa. And the, um, the objective of this coalition is to, uh, to bring together uh, you know, stakeholders that share the same objective of, you know, growing uh, the, the internet in, in Africa. Of course, you know, each uh, uh, member or each partner in this coalition uh, comes with their own, you know, expertise and, uh, you know, contribution and so on. Uh, from, from our uh, uh, part as, as ICANN, uh, we did, uh, and that is one project that we worked on in the past few months as part of this coalition, we did um, uh, deploy a significant piece of uh, internet infrastructure in Kenya. Uh, we call it, you know, root server cluster. And what this root server basically does, it helps keep the internet traffic in Africa within Africa. And instead of, you know, having the traffic 
travel to Europe or some, somewhere else. So through this coalition and the partners that we're working on, uh, we're going to you know, um, do uh, 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 a lot of you know, capacity building uh, across you know, youth and African uh, uh, community. We're going to work on increasing the security of the internet infrastructure in, um, in, uh, in Africa. We're going also to explore ways to um, introduce African languages to the internet. Africa has over 2,000 languages. Of course, many of them are not, you know, uh, like written uh, languages. Many of them do not exist on the internet, but at least for those that do exist on the internet, we're going to try to bring this to the naming system of the internet so that to allow Africans to have, you know, the and to enjoy, actually, the experience of using the internet fully in their native language. All right, uh, Glenn, let me ask you the final question. When I was beginning this panel, I talked about Isaac Asimov and what he wrote down about 30, 40 years ago. As a futurist, um, paint me a picture of what uh, our world, um, especially the media world, will look like, do you think? 30 years from now, we will be living in the matrix. Uh, 30 years from now, uh, a brain-computer interface won't be something that we talk about, but probably something that, that we all have, uh, something that, that allows us to tap into instantly digital in information. Uh, we already have AI newscasters. Uh, in the future, 30 years from now, like today, we'll still be struggling to find voices that we trust. And this is what's so important when we have conversations about technology, is how do we make it people-centric? And how do we find technology that, that, that we trust? Uh, it will be a fantastic future in which, uh, when we hear about news, we can visit and talk to the people who are the newsmakers. Uh, but it will still be that future in which I think we'll, we'll still have that important task of finding the voices we trust. Um, I can say one last thing. Yeah, one last thing. As, uh, as Reagan said about the Soviet Union, trust but verify. We should do the same with technology. Trust the future, the positive elements of technology, but verify. Okay. Um, we are at the a dawn of a new age, uh, like you said at the beginning of uh, your speech. We are at a renaissance. Um, most people don't know where we're going. Some people do. Uh, but we, what we do know is that we need to get the youth involved. It needs to be inclusive. There needs to be an element of um, inclusiveness, centricness, uh, and trust. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking our esteemed panelists, Maurizio Gheri, Bahar Esmat, and Glenn Glamour. Thank you very much. I do enjoy talking to you.